All right, so I've started the recording and I would like to welcome everyone to this February session of the Forest Connect webinar series. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and uh, I've been running this monthly webinar series for about 12 years now and I'm, I've been joined by many, many good speakers. Uh, today we're joined by Dave McGill who is a great speaker. Dave gave a presentation on Forest Connect a couple of years ago about silviculture that was very well received and I asked Dave to um, if he had something else that he'd like to, to run with, and he said, how about tree identification? <laughs> I thought, great, I love it. It's always popular, and that's the case here. We're at 150, so I'm going to mute my microphone, and Dave, it's all yours. I'm going to hover in the background, so thanks for joining us. Great. Hey, thanks, Pete. Uh, hope you can hear me, and um, uh, again, I'm very happy to be here. The um, uh, the topic's uh, one of my favorites, and uh, um, it's something that foresters love to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, trees and shrubs. So um, uh, today I'm going to um, uh, you know, just kind of give you a briefing about some of these attributes we look at in identification. And when you think about it, tree identification is really one of the first classes that foresters have to take is kind of an introduction into these these giant organisms that make up the forest and um, you know dendrology is really the study of trees and in that we have a big component of that is you know the whole identification thing how to identify trees you know, I don't teach dendrology here at West Virginia University uh, but I teach many workshops and seminars and short courses around West Virginia and even have a little graduate student class uh, where I uh, you know the graduate students learn the trees and shrubs and then uh, have them go out in the, into the field uh, or into evening sessions to help me teach these adult uh, winter tree ID workshops. It's uh, usually a lot of fun. You know. So I get to talk about tree ID and in doing so I'm hoping uh, the audience will, um, if I can click this uh, forward here, there we go. I hope the audience uh, will become familiar with um, or for those more proficient tree ideas out there at least review um, the attributes that help us distinguish among the woody plant species, you know, in our region. I know I saw we saw um, Idaho and Louisiana very different out there, but uh, here in the eastern deciduous forest, uh, for most for the most part, you know, when I do our tree ID workshops, I, I like to poll the audience, and I'm not going to do that here today. But uh, when I do it, I, I I get a couple experts. You know, I give them on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the expert, you know, they've trained people or they've helped to teach tree ID, uh, to one, which is novice. Um, I usually get uh, below fives, uh, but I'm guessing on this webinar, uh, if you followed Pete's uh, Forest Connect seminar, I'm, I'm guessing um, uh, we're, we're at fives and above. So I'm hoping, so some of those fives and above, you, you take away some uh, a, a good review of the attributes that help us distinguish these plants from one another. And for those people below a five, I hope you um, can find out, uh, take away some new information. Uh, another thing uh, I'd like uh, to have come out of this is um, an appreciation for woody plant attributes other than leaves. And the reason we're not going to focus a lot about leaves is because they're really already rather familiar with us. I mean, of all the attributes that we look at, uh, uh, leaves are probably the most familiar of all of, of all the attributes on trees. And, and in, in fact, the title of this talk, uh, you know, look beyond the leaves, that's kind of a mantra we have uh, to encourage our students to look at other features uh, uh, other than the leaves. And uh, finally, I hope we might get a feeling uh, of about which attributes that we use in tree identification that might help us uh, work through field uh, field guides and keys and so forth. You know, so this is really kind of a presentation that might be found at the very beginning of a of a dendrology dendrology class or tree ID class, and uh, it means we're really not going to study the unique species and the names of trees, but rather just the attributes that we can use to set them apart from one another. I, uh, I do know there's uh, a lot of challenges and pitfalls and in, in, in when we have to learn about trees and recognize trees and shrubs. Uh, I, I often start with a slide like this and um, I ask my audience, I say, what do you see? And inevitably, <laughs> you know, the people who are willing to speak up, um, they say a butterfly or a monarch. And I 
um, I use this to, oh, my, my Siri uh, just turned on. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, uh, I use this slide to convey this idea uh, that we as humans have this inherent environmental bias, a bias where we, we, where we relate to and pay more attention to animals uh, than plants. And uh, some of the botanists have coined a term for this. It's called uh, plant blindness. And, and I bring this up, uh, especially for educators uh, who haven't heard of it, uh, because it's really kind of, um, uh, some people have this more than others. And so when you teach tree ID, uh, you can really see um, it's, it's a real challenge and a frustration for some people to look at plants. It's not a bad thing. It's, a, it's very normal. And in fact, plant blindness just has to do with the in inability of humans to notice plants, to recognize their importance in the biosphere, and to appreciate their aesthetic uh, uh, beauty, really. And uh, this has been pointed out, and, and a lot of our school programs are kind of aim at trying to cure some of this thing, some of this uh, plant blindness, like nature on your way to school and, and programs like that. Um, but for many people, um, it's, uh, it's difficult to make distinctions and know the different plant species. You know, so, so plant blindness is a, is, a, is a normal state for many of us and just a real challenge to overcome you know, as we try to learn these uh, and identify plants. Again, just something to be aware of as we're, as we're especially for uh, the novices, the beginners, as we get into this stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, we do love our trees. Uh, especially these ones that really stand out, like that one over on the left there. Uh, my daughter's standing there for scale. This is, a, this is the champion cottonwood tree out in Colorado on the University of, of Boulder campus. And then over on the right, uh, if you look down in the woods, that's Jim Bowen, a West Virginia Division of Forestry forester, standing at the base of a pretty unique species. This is a table mountain pine. It's uh, 96 and a half feet tall. Usually these pines are only growing on the very tops of ridges in very dry conditions. So very unique to find a big tree like that. And then here's one, uh, Mickey Mouse, you know, the mammal. <laughs> no, uh, actually we came to this property to, to visit the champion box elder tree uh, here in West Virginia, but unfortunately it had it died a, a couple of years ago, but, uh, but there we have it. So we do appreciate our trees. Uh, uh, and a lot of times uh, we really relish having these special trees uh, despite our, our plant blindness, right? Uh, so um, it makes sense that we want to be able to name trees. And that's kind of the goal of tree identification, uh, to ascribe a, a name to a tree. But, but one way can, we can study trees is by looking at them as a set of attributes they possess. You know, one place we can find the attributes that are in these, in these tree ID keys. And um, here's one in front of us. Uh, it's an old one, but uh, we use it in our classes uh, because they don't change very much. Uh, and uh, these tree keys, these dichotomous keys, I'm sure you've all seen them. Uh, if you haven't, uh, dichotomous keys are just basically um, a, a little tool that uh, gives you basically two, sometimes three attributes. And then you, uh, you have a specimen in your hand, you read the attributes, and you pick the one that most closely fits the one uh, that you have. Uh, so, um, one thing about these dichotomous keys is they have the most important attributes way up at the top there where it says ones and two and the ones and the twos. And um, uh, so when we, when we look at a tree or shrub and try to identify it, what something isn't can be as important as, as what something is. For example, up here, see that little arrow popped up? Um, uh, this is asking one of the most important questions about distinguishing between trees and shrubs. Uh, different trees is that um, are there leaves persistent in green uh, are leaves persistent in green throughout the winter or are leaves absent in terms of you know these are actually the deciduous trees so big uh, important feature there uh, are they evergreen or deciduous um, uh, I think most people think about these keys as a way to uh, figure out what a particular tree is and its name what we call it uh, but another way we can use these keys is to explore the attributes that the trees possess relative to one another. You know, for example, here I have in, circled in blue, in solid blue, tupelo, which we call black gum here. Um, and um, according to this key, tupelo or black gum is very similar to hackberry, which is right above it in the stippled line, and maybe even similar in some ways to black walnut and butternut uh, just above it. 
you know, so we can explore these diagnostic attributes or features about uh, trees um, by finding a tree in the key and working our way backwards. Here are all the um, stages we've gone through to arrive at Tupelo from that key. And so really, uh, this is just a collection of attributes uh, for the Tupelo and for this region. So black gum is really identified by this unique set of attributes. And uh, don't be worried if you don't recognize these uh, attributes. We're going to be going into a number of them uh, uh, very soon. Um, but we can see um, trees. We, we could think of trees and shrubs this way as these sets of attributes that are unique to the, to the tree. But, but you have to remember that um, the, this set of attributes is, is unique only for black gum. It's only unique for black gum in the region where this key was developed. Now, if we expand that region, uh, we might find another tree with similar attributes. Um, and then we would have to add in some other features to help us distinguish that from from black gum, and uh, hopefully that'll become more clear as we move along. Um, and this is sometimes what you, how you wind up with um, when you do these online keys. Uh, you can go through the keys, you know, these dichotomous keys, making selections, and wind up with a big long list of uh, of species. Uh, they're not always; uh, they don't always arrive at a single uh, species. You know, so so here are the here are these. Uh, uh, the areas of interest I'm going to cover today, you know, they're basically the parts and general form and the appearance of a tree. And each has several diagnostic attributes. You know, as, as much as I try and minimize uh, the leaves, you know, look beyond the leaves, uh, we are going to spend some time on leaves because people are already very familiar with them. Uh, we still are going to talk to them, talk about them a little bit here. Okay, so, so leaves are good attributes. Don't want to downplay them too much. Uh, but um, again, they're, uh, they're, we are most familiar with them. And so a lot of times when I teach class, I try to focus on some of the other attributes. Uh, but, so leaves are good, but uh, they are not always definitive. Uh, there are a lot of look-alike leaves out there. And they're not always available, uh, both temporally in time. For example, now they're not there. For a good part of the year, they're not there. And spatially, you know, they're not always available to us. A lot of times they're inaccessible, either from distance, like across a creek, or uh, looking up, uh, they're 70 feet up, up in the air in the, in the forest canopy. So, so leaves are good, but not always uh, helpful. When we look at to see exactly what a leaf is, it's basically a structure that consists of a blade and a little stalk called a petiole. So this is a simple leaf a blade and a stalk. You know, uh, the blade contains all the machinery necessary for photosynthesis, you know, the process that, you know, takes uh, sunlight and, uh, and, uh, and carbon and, and makes little sugars and other molecules and stores that energy uh, for the tree to use. Uh, so this is a simple leaf, blade and a stalk called petiole. This is a compound leaf. You know, it almost looks, uh, it's so long, it almost looks like a branch. Uh, a compound leaf is made up of, of leaflets. Uh, the leaflets are attached to a little stalk called the rachis, uh, which is really just an extension of the petiole. So, so Diraj here is actually holding on to the petiole, and the rest of that stalk is, is the rachis. And attached to those are uh, the leaflets. So very large, single, compound leaf has many leaflets. This is a tree of heaven leaf, very large one. So well, that begs the question, you know, how do we tell the difference between a leaf and a leaflet? Well, um, uh, like, because the tree of heaven almost looked like a branch, right? Uh, so here is an American persimmon twig on the left and a black ash leaflet on the right. You know, the big difference is that leaves all have lateral buds you know, right there in the little angle or axle where the petiole meets the woody stem. And at that point, we call that the node, where the petiole meets the woody stem is the node. You know, the axle is the upper angle between the leaf stalk and the woody twig. In contrast, over on the right there, um, the leaflet is attached to the rachis and has no bud in that little angle. So that's how you tell the difference between a leaf and a leaflet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the you know, leaves um, are good attributes to help with GID, but they're not always definitive. And this is some examples of that. 
Um, here are a few leaves uh, of the white ash, for example, uh, up on the upper left-hand corner. All those leaves came from the same branch. And so the one on the left has seven leaflets, the one on the right has five, and there's a tiny little one with six <laughs> there, a second from the right. Uh, the mulberry, too, that's another one. Uh, look at the one on the bottom with these, the sinuses, the deep indentations into the leaf blade. You know, those are very, very diagnostic, very characteristic of a, of a mulberry. But the one in the left hand is a mulberry leaf, too. So you don't always get the, the uh, unique, the uniquely shaped uh, leaf on the tree. And then most people probably recognize those leaves down on the bottom, the sassafras. You know, this is three of the four shapes. This is the, the right hand glove, right hand mitten, the ghost, and the egg. You know, the problem is with this is sometimes sassafras don't have leaves that are shaped like a, a ghost or a mitten. So they can be uh, kind of tough to identify just based on the leaves. You know, furthermore, you know, the leaves uh, from different trees can look very much alike. You know, at the top here, a few common spruces we have around here, some planted as ornamentals, uh, all have linear leaves. Now, some have different colors, like the blue spruce, uh, you know, the third on the right up there at the top, uh, but uh, the colors may not always be so prominent as, as in this picture. You know, on the bottom is a whole row of four different leaves. You know, they're, uh, they're all simple leaves, like blade and a stalk all simple leaves. They all have a little jagged edge, a little serrated edge or margin of the leaf. They are, they're, they're, their veins are all fairly parallel. Um, and so they are very similar, even though all these four leaves are from different species. So leaves are good, helpful, but not always 100% diagnostic. You know, we'll talk a little bit more about leaves later on, but, but let's look at the trunk for right now or the stem of the tree. You know, this is what we see in the woods in the leaf off period. It's a beautiful time to be in the woods. You know, there's no, uh, no uh, ground nesting bees, the yellow jackets, no, no, none of these spider webs to catch you in the face. And uh, great time to work out there. Um, so foresters really rely on these uh, trunk attributes and stem attributes to not only for tree identification, but really also to assess stem quality. And sometimes these two things go hand in hand. So um, to... Uh, to take a look at um, the importance or, or the, the variability of bark, it's really important to be able to look inside uh, and understand what's going on. So inside the tree, um, we, and most of you have probably had this in basic botany class, but there are, are a couple types of vascular tissue, and these are the fluid conducting tissues. In this diagram, you know, the blue represents the xylem or the wood tissue, and this, these little you know, tubes, this vascular tissue, um, conducts water and nutrients from the roots all the way up into the stem, all the way out to the branches, and into the very tips into the leaves. And the phloem, uh, depicted as re the red tissue here, that's the uh, also called the inner bark. Um, that conducts the sugar solution downward. So two types of vascular tissue uh, are present in these in these woody plants that we're that we're studying. When you look at a uh, older stem, you know, we can see similar structures. Looks a little different you know, than the one-year-old twig we were looking at. Uh, but in this case, you know, the, fart, the, the, uh, the bark is more fully developed. That, there it is on the outside, the outer bark. That's what we see. You know, the uh, layer on the inside, as this artist has depicted it, is the inner bark, that phloem tissue. Again, the tissue that conducts the sugar solution from the leaves all the way down into the tree, even all the way down into the roots to feed those roots. Uh, on the inside is the wood tissue, the xylem tissue, and here it's broken up into sapwood and heartwood. And so again, the xylem tissue conducts the water and nutrients from the ground up into the stem, all the way up into the branches and the leaves. Uh, the sapwood here is just the functional xylem. That's actually the tissue that's conducting the fluid, whereas the heartwood is, is no longer functional, it just supports, supports the stem. Anyway, there's another little layer here, in the green layer, is that is the cambium. That is a, a meristematic tissue, a growth tissue that produces both of these types of vascular uh, tissues. And it's kind of a miraculous thing. Uh, the cells are all the same, but when a cell migrates towards the outside, towards the inner bark, it differentiates into the, into the types of cells that we find in the phloem. And when a cell migrates to the inside, 
and my line just uh, I pressed the wrong button there. When it migrates to the inside, it differentiates into xylem tissue or that tissue that conducts the water. So, so pretty interesting tissue. And so you can imagine that is the growing tissue and, and more wood is produced than, uh, more wood tissue or xylem tissue is produced than phloem tissue. So that's kind of how the tree grows. And we can envision this growing and one of the things about the tree growth, you know, the faster the tree is growing, the faster the vascular cavity is laying down xylem on the inside, the wood cells, the faster the outer bark tissue has to adapt to that enlarging stem. You know, so you might be sitting there thinking, what's all this have to do with tree ID? <laughs> so, but so, so this is it here. Um, trees that are growing differently look different. Um, on this is, you know, I didn't take these pictures, but uh, I pulled these off the web a long time ago. And if anyone knows who did, uh, I'd love to give them credit for it, but it's just fantastic. They're both yellow birch stems. The one over on the left, that is almost 16 inches DVH, diameter breast height, four and a half feet above the ground. That's where we foresters measure these trees. And, uh, and that one is growing eight tenths of an inch per decade. So rather slow. The yellow birch on the right is also about 16 inches DVH, but it's growing almost four times as fast. And so you can almost envision the enlarging stem with inside, inside, you know, the, the vascular cambium putting on lots and lots of cells on the inside and almost pushing out on the bark. And so that is, um, that, that bark really has to adapt to this enlarging stem much more quickly than the one on the left. And in fact, when I'm out in the woods and I see a tree that like I don't really know what it is right off. It's usually one of those on the left that is really not growing very fast and looks kind of um, not very characteristic. So, so it really makes a difference in, in the growth rate of trees and how trees are growing in, in how their bark looks on the outside. You know, so help us out with this bark, because it's bark we don't learn a lot about. You know, through my school, I didn't really learn so much about bark, but a few years ago, you know, this, this uh, fellow, uh, Mr. Wajtek up uh, from New England, did developed this great book on bark. It's really um, added to, I think, a lot of people's appreciation of what bark is, the, the complex tissue it represents. And, and the neat thing of, is about this book, he's really created this categorization of this bark into, uh, um, um, the, uh, into a system that we can use to talk about bark uh, more readily. And so I'm gonna, just going to go down through these different bark types so you can kind of get familiar with, 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 uh, with bark a little bit, as, at least in terms of how he characterizes it. So um, first off, uh, bark, you have to be careful because bark for a particular species, bark can look very different at different life stages. Now here's a shag bark hickory up here in the upper left-hand corner, very young. It doesn't really start to split until it gets to be like a teenager. Right? And then it starts to split and becomes, you know, has this uh, stripped bark, uh, uh, shaggy look, uh, like over on the upper uh, right uh, through time. But they don't always look the same. Uh, trees change as they grow. So here's that first category, smooth, unbroken bark. And most of you probably recognize uh, the, um, the American beech right? Uh, because of the uh, graffiti on it. <laughs> it's the tree that most uh, commonly gets carved up because it doesn't slough off. It's very smooth, very solid. Uh, peeling horizontally in strips. This is the second category. Um, uh, this is a, a little river birch uh, near, nearby. And uh, we, our eyes immediately go to the white bark and the peeling kind of salmon colored inner bark of, these, of, these tree, of this tree. Um, and I use this slide actually to represent, um, to, to talk about um, how our minds work when we actually go out in the field. Because we talk about one attribute at a time in some of these slides. But if we were really there on site, uh, you'd be looking at the white bark, but then your eyes would glance up at the tree crown and the, and the character of the tree crown. And you'd notice that actually all of these trees are river birch, even the ones there on the left and down uh, in by the, by the creek. So they're not all peeling and bright like this one. So second category. Here's another category, visible lenticels. This is our little black cherry. And the lenticels are the little structures in the, in the bark that actually allow gas exchange into and out of the bark. It's kind of like the little, we all kind of learn about leaves, 
right? And, and the, the leaves have the little stomates or stomata that allow gas exchange into and out of the leaf. Well, these are the structures that allow gas exchange into and out of the stem of the tree. Because remember, inside that bark, there's a meristematic tissue, a growing tissue that is respiring, it's burning sugars, and needs oxygen, you know, to, to, to fulfill all, the, all those uh, the growth uh, requirements. You know, so visible lenticels is another category. Here's my favorite category, just because it has such a long <laughs> name. Uh, vertical cracks or seams in otherwise smooth bark. And so you can see the, the bark is not really hard. It's, if you felt it, these would be little rounded edges, almost a ridge. Um, but this is uh, one of those kind of funny things I, 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 I fooled the audience a little bit with. And this is a shag bark hickory. It's a young shag bark hickory, not shaggy at all. Um, it's very smooth when it's a very young tree. So uh, that's uh, the fourth category. Here's the, what we generally think of when we think about the shag bark hickory, these vertical strips of bark. And that's the fifth category, stripped bark. Then finally, we have one, uh, scales or plates. Uh, this is a honey locust. You can see these plates peeling up. And in fact, bark can have multiple attributes. Remember, we had that one attribute called um, visible lenticels. You can see on these plates, uh, the lenticels from, they're non-functional, of course, because they're up on plates and not connected uh, any longer with the, with the, with the bark. But uh, you can see kind of two attributes on this, on this specimen. And finally, ridges and fur furrows. This is probably the category with, with most of the, you know, that most of the trees uh, will fall into at one time or another in their, in their lives. And uh, these uh, ridges, basically the ridges are the high spots on the bark. The furrows are on the low, the low spot, spot, spots on the bark. And uh, this is a big old uh, yellow poplar tree um, that uh, we found a couple weeks ago at a, a state park. A very big, thick, thick bark on that one. Um, so this, these ridged barks, though, they can develop different patterns. So uh, here is, an, is, is a white ash, and we know that white ash can uh, tend to develop kind of the diamond shapes in the bark. And basically, it's because these, they appear to be interbraided, where the, a ridge will come and join another ridge and form kind of a downward-facing V, or they'll split and, face and, you know, and create an upward-facing V, almost a diamond shape in their appearance. They'll also become blocky. And blockiness in bark, and there's a number of species that have very blocky bark. This is the American persimmon, one of the most blocky, I think, uh, in terms of the little squares. Uh, the American persimmon, uh, the blocks develop because there's a little horizontal fissure that uh, breaks across the ridge and uh, forms this block appearance you know, to our eyes. One of my favorite trees, American persimmon. So bark, you know, as I mentioned, doesn't really get much of a shake in some classes uh, uh, because uh, especially forestry, you know, we're kind of focused on wood sometimes. Uh, but here I found this little poem and I'm going to read it to you as uh, part of bark appreciation, you know, and uh, it's called Bark World. It's by Olivia Byard. She's a, an English poet, poet. And um, it goes like this, Bark World. Rough, tough to touch, grooved, ridge, scaled. Textures and fissures, teeming with the fuss and stress of being, dark crevices crammed with many beasts, wood lice, beetles, boars, and wispy spiders that scurry across burled highways, algae, lichen, moss, growing warmth, cover over tiny birds tight in dark holes, feather to feather, beak to beak, a claw here, an eye there, flutter, shuffle, first squawks and squeaks, and the deep inside where sap rises rich and quick, grains, circles, lines, and yearly mark marks of tell time, old time, now time, pest, disease, and blight time, warming time, losing time, a stopped clock at felled time. So uh, this is just meant for a little bark appreciation and, uh, and uh, you know, because if we don't appreciate bark, we may not look at it as much. So just a great poem about bark to inspire our appreciation of it. Um, on to twigs. Twigs are another feature uh, of, of trees that there are a lot of, a lot of different attributes on the twig themselves. You know, there's the twig thickness, leaf arrangement, surface texture, end buds, lateral buds, leaf scars, bundle scars, stipule scars. In the winter, there are a lot of scars, you know, because, because things fall off of the tree uh, from the growing season. Then lentils and pith types. So, so we're going to go through uh, each of these so you can kind of get familiar with them if you've never seen them and uh, kind of review them if you, uh, you have seen them. So first, you know, is twig thickness. This is really an important attribute. 
it's uh it's one that when you step back from the tree and look up at it you really notice it especially if there's trees side by side we have a twig over on the left hand side that's super thick and those spots are the the leaf scars where the leaves have fallen off but that's a big tree of heaven twig uh, the one to the right of that is a catalpa and uh, then we move on to a couple of a few actually maples the third one over is a norway spruce one of the most or norway maple excuse me one of the most uh, stout twigs of the maple uh, there's a little red maple red reddish color the green one's another maple it's uh, ash leaf maple or the box elder and then there's an american elm uh sugar maple sycamore and a uh, uh a um a white mulberry over on the right there so very high diversity of of twig thickness there and that really helps uh and and there will there will be questions in these keys about all these attributes thickness is one of those relative things that sometimes is kind of hard to figure out when you're working in a key you know is this thick or is it or is it or is it or is it uh, uh, thin and uh, sometimes they give you help uh, by actually giving you a measurement uh, in some keys, but uh, it can be kind of uh, very relevant, uh, uh, relative. So leaf arrangement is another feature, and, um, and there are basically five different types of leaf arrangement. Remember, uh, coming down through the keys, that first one was, is it evergreen or deciduous? One of the next Im most important features is this leaf arrangement. And so um, we have fascicled leaf arrangement, clustered leaf arrangement, like in the larches, um, alternate leaf arrangement where there's a single leaf at each of the nodes, opposite leaf arrangement where you have one leaf and then to get to the next nearest leaf, you just pop over the other side of the stem, and then world leaf arrangement where you have more than two leaves at each node. And uh, so here's an example of fascicled. I don't have a pointer, but if you follow these uh, needles down to the base where they all come together. That that little piece of tissue there is called the fascicle, and um, it is uh, it is the first thing we do when we come to a pine tree, right? We count the number of needles. This is our little pitch pine, three needles per fascicle. Um, the clustered buds, um, not too common, but this is a little um, larch, a European larch, and you can look down into the buds and see the little needles sticking out this is one of those special trees you know most conifers we think of as being evergreen but this is one of the deciduous ever deciduous conifers the larch uh, so here it is uh in, in leaf off condition but the buds tucked away down in there are the little leaves that in spring will pop out and uh you know and uh, begin to uh, produce sugars for the tree again so clustered leaf arrangement. Uh, alternate leaf arrangement, I have this um, uh, listed, labeled in terms of these ones, there's one leaf attached at each of these nodes. And for some of you, you might be able to see the little lateral bud that's uh, between the little leaf stalk and the woody stem. The lateral buds are axillary buds there. So single leaf at each node. And this one kind of zigzags down, uh, down, the, down the twig. That's the Eastern red bud, right? So uh, opposite leaves, uh, here is an example, a couple examples um, where I have the one leaf on one side, the second leaf on the other side. So this is opposite leaf arrangement. And uh, these are, one of them is uh, the winged burning bush, real pretty in the, in the, in the fall. And then the others of black maple that, uh, that we have, have outside of town. So um, where you have uh, opposite leaf arrangement. We, we actually have a little mnemonic, a, a learning tool that we use. Uh, we, we, we say madcap burning buck. Some people call it, say madcap horse. But uh, madcap burning buck is a little way that we can remember all the trees and shrubs with, well, there are some exceptions, <laughs> all the trees and shrubs with opposite leaf arrangement. And so the M of madcap stands for the maples. A stands for the ash, D stands for the dogwoods, CAP stands for the Caprifoliaceae family, which used to stand for more than honeysuckles, and sometimes we include the, uh, the elderberry and the viburnums uh, in that family, uh, but those all have opposite leaf arrangements as well. And so then the burning stands for bur the burning bushes, the euonymus species, and finally the buckeyes, you know, uh, madcap burning bucks. So, so if you walk up to a, a tree in the woods or a shrub even, and it has opposite leaf arrangement, it's a madcap burning buck, more than likely, madcap burning buck. So it's either a maple ash, a dogwood, one of the Caprifoliaceae family, the honeysuckles, right? The bur a burning bush or a buckeye. 
And again, there are some exceptions, but it's, it's kind of nice because if it is a madcap burning buck, then you don't have to worry about like the oaks, the willows, the birches, all those other ones with alternate leaf arrangements. So, so it's a little help tool to, uh, to as, we, as we begin to learn uh, trees and shrubs. And finally, uh, there's the world leaf arrangement. Now, this is pretty rare. Uh, the only one really we have in our state of woody plants well, we actually have a shrub, but the, of, of trees is the catalpa. And so you can see here over on the left where we have the three leaves coming in at a node. So this is really the only case of trees having world leaf arrangement, at least in our region. Um, so in the leaf off condition, you know, how do you tell where the leaves were? Well, remember that um, uh, uh, each leaf comes into the stem and connects with it at a node. And in that axle are the lateral buds. So even though the leaves have fallen off, in many cases, we can just see where the lateral buds are and as well the leaf scars where the leaf was to determine whether or not, uh, or what type of leaf arrangement the, the tree had in the leaf on condition. You know, so a shagbark hickory on the, on the left there has, you know, very large and very divergent buds, you know, pointing out from the from the twig. And the little ash over on the, the white ash over on the, the right there has opposite leaf arrangement. Could you see those lateral buds right across from one another? Okay, so uh, the buds, uh, buds are pretty unique little things. And uh, I like to sometimes uh, share how other people look at them. And Annie Oaks Huntington was a uh, was a naturalist around the turn of last century and wrote a little book called Studies of Tree in Winter. And um, she says, buds contain complete branches in miniature, which develop in the spring into a new crop of twigs. You know, we hear, we call these, you know, she calls these um, branches in miniature inside the bud. That's what the buds are, branches in miniature. We call them embryonic shoots, so baby shoots, right? So, um, so when a bud breaks, it's not just one leaf that comes out or a couple leaves. It's a whole shoot system. It's a shoot full of leaves and sometimes uh, flower structures as well. So these are very diagnostic, very distinct, you know, between uh, different species. And um, uh, so these are all end buds. The one over on the left there, many of you recognize is the American beech, long cigar shaped bud, very long. And uh, the one in the middle, whenever you see clustered end buds or clustered terminal buds, uh, we say think oaks. Indeed, this is a this is a scarlet oak there. And the one over on the on the right is one of my favorite uh, buds, real pretty little bud, like a almost like a Hershey kiss or a teardrop. And uh, that is the the mockernut hickory, really pretty little things. We can also get false end buds. Some trees have what's called indeterminate growth form, uh, which means that the stem will keep growing and producing new leaves until the growing conditions are unfavorable. So, so too dry, uh, uh, too cold, you know, short day length, things like that. And so what happens at that point is that um, the portion of that stem will just dry up and uh, it'll fall off. And, uh, and what happens is the, is the, is the last fully formed lateral bud appears to be a terminal bud, but really it's a false terminal bud, or sometimes people call it a pseudo-terminal bud. Um, a lot of trees have this indeterminate growth form. You know, here are a number of them, and what they leave is they leave a shoot scar, you know, where that terminal, you know, that undeveloped terminal portion of the twig dried up and fell off. You know, the um, there's uh, over on the left here, we have the, the American sycamore, uh, the Eastern sycamore, and then we have an American, American elm right there at the top right, showing almost like a crater where, the, where that shoot fell off. And then down at the bottom is, a, is American basswood also showing a shoot scar. So, so these things with indeterminate growth, they also tend to exhibit a zigzag growth form where the twig will kind of be growing one way and then at the next node, it'll shift and uh, kind of turn direction. So uh, these plants with false end buds typically have zigzag growth form. You know, axillary buds are another attribute of importance. You know, axillary or lateral buds, remember we called them. So a lot of variation in these. It's almost, these 
because they're almost as distinct. You can't say like a fingerprint because you know, fingerprints allow us to tell individuals from one another, but they definitely help tell the difference between species. And so in the upper left there, that's a little uh, slippery elm or red elm. The middle one is a uh, American basswood, kind of like an egg shape. There's usually just two little bud scales on that. It's kind of always looking lopsided as it sits on the twig. Over the little spines over there, some of you will recognize that as the black locust, and those are little stipular spines we'll talk about. And that bud actually sits down in kind of a furry little bed of hairs. You kind of see it breaking through a little tissue at the top there, but if you dissect that, you'll find actually it's kind of deep down in there where you, where you get to the actual bud, uh, all insulated from the winter. And then down at the bottom over on the left, that little stalked bud is our Brookside alder. And uh, that funny looking uh, little uh, bud, lateral bud uh, on the lower right is a blue ash. And uh, blue ash is pretty rare here in our state. We have it in a couple counties. This came from one of those counties. And uh, it, uh, it's pretty unique looking. And it has these little wings. Actually, you can possibly see these little wings, these excurrences, these corky ridges that go down from that leaf scar. So all very distinct. And all of these uh, help us you know, distinguish between one species and the next. Uh, we also might you'll be able to see as you're looking around out there at these twigs, uh, superposed buds. And uh, uh, this is where there's two buds, and uh, sit, one sits on top of the other, basically. So, so you see, first of all, you see the leaf scar down at the bottom. You can see down in there some bundle scars, we're called. And then up above there is a flower bud, and above that is the vegetative bud. So uh, this black walnut, so, the, so the, the flower bud will break open and what comes out of that are the male flowers, little pendulous strings of, of, of male flowers called catkins, and those will produce flowers. Those will produce the pollen uh, that will be uh, released uh, in the spring. So superposed buds. You also might find collateral buds, which are basically just buds that sit side by side on each side of the, of the leaf scar or lateral bud. This is a spice bush. It has these little globose flower buds that uh, sometimes, if we're lucky, we can see them. It's a real giveaway for what that is. Okay, so and on top of these buds, um, each of these buds is covered with scales. And uh, here's Annie Oaks Huntington again, and, and her view of this is, you know, she says, by opening a bud in winter, the little leaves can be seen and often a cluster of flowers. Again, embryonic shoots, right? Packed away from the cold in marvelous warm wrappings. So uh, these bud scales are, are really just wrappings to protect that embryonic shoot within. This is, again, this is a, a shagbark hickory. So all, uh, there's basically three types of bud scales or buds. Uh, these are overlapping or imbricate buds. And you can see the black cherry there. Each of those individual scales on the bud uh, they're kind of the, the top part of the scale is brown and the bottom part is greenish or, or yellow. And over on the right, a northern red oak. Northern red oaks are usually pretty, pretty smooth and hairless, but sometimes you can get a little bit of hair developing at the tip there. Again, when we see the clustered end buds, we think oaks, one of the oaks. Another type of bud is called valvate, the valvate bud, uh, bud scales, and I give the analogy, you know, when you go to the beach, you find a clam, it's a bivalve, right, so you have two, two pieces, and these, uh, these buds are basically made of just two bud scales, and they come up and join right at that fissure you can see on the striped maple at the left or, or the yellow poplar on the right, so valvate buds. And then finally, we have foliate buds. And foliate buds are basically, um, we can also call them naked buds. You know, and so foliate buds are basically just the leaf that's sitting out there and covered with some kind of either scales, like the, for, uh, uh, the witch hazel over on the left, or the, uh, the hairs, all those hairs, like the, the poison ivy shoot on the right. Now, to, to understand the next uh, attribute, we have to go back inside the leaf a little bit, and um, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, bundle scale scars, or bundle scars, and uh, so we're going to go back into the, the, the talk about the vascular system a little bit. In the leaf, of course, we all know that they have veins, a real uh, a complex system of veins, and I uh, use this 
pretty cool uh, chart someone did. Uh, there's this re reference down at the bottom if you want to go get it yourself. Uh, but uh, it's a cutaway of a leaf. And of course, at the top, there's a waxy cuticle that keeps the moisture in. Same at the bottom. And um, all this complex system of, of cells the, that uh, contain the, the, the machinery for photosynthesis. At the bottom, you can see the little stoma the holes, the pores that allow gas exchange into and out of the leaf. And then over here, you have these veins, and there they are again. You have the xylem and the phloem. Remember, we saw this down in the stem of the tree, the xylem and the phloem, the xylem being the wood tissue down there, and the phloem being that inner bark tissue. Um, so here they are again. And so what's happening is the water is coming all the way from the roots up into this, up into this leaf through the xylem, and the sugar solution being produced uh, by the leaf is flowing back down out into the tree through the phloem. So, so there they are. So, so here in the leaf, these xylem, the xylem and phloem are bundled together in what are called vascular bundles or these veins. So, so what happens is when the leaves fall off, so here they are, vascular bundles. When the leaves fall off, they leave these little scars where those vascular bundles came through the petiole and connected with the stem. And so down here in figure 11, uh, you can see this little white ash uh, figure uh, with these little dots in a row, kind of this curvilinear, or maybe for you mathematicians, a catenary, right? A dangling chain or something. <laughs> um, uh, those little dots, uh, those are all where the tubes went in. The veins went into the, into the tree at that point when the leaves obsized or fell off the tree, you know, they left these little scars. And these scars can be very characteristic. Now, here's a number of them. Over on the left, you see the big shield-shaped leaf scar with, you know, two dots up on each side and kind of a, a, a field of, of white in the middle of that leaf scar. Now, that's the uh, yellow buckeye. And then in the middle, again, we, we, we've kind of overused our shagbark hickory. <laughs> there it is again. You can see these, these kind of fields or, 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 um, or uh, patches of, of, of these vascular bundles in, in, the, um, in the leaf scar. And over down here on the on the right, I kind of had to put a blue circle on there because it's hard to see, but that's a leaf scar with a little ironwood or eastern hop hornbeam uh, that only has three little vascular bundle uh, scars. So pretty interesting, and, and you will be asked those as you're going through the key. You know, how many, how many bundle scars does it have? And so these, again, are features that you will find in all sorts of botanical books, in diagnostic keys, and so forth. You know, another feature that we see on twigs are stipules, and basically stipules is kind of like a botanical term, you know, and sometimes botanical terms are kind of hard to remember, but the operating word there is outgrowth. It's some kind of outgrowth at the base of a leaf. So even, remember when we saw the lateral bud of the black locust with those spines sticking out? Those spines were at the base of the leaf. They're called stipular spines. So stipules are just outgrowths at the base of the leaf. This one here over on the left, that's an American sycamore. It's a leafy-like structure that wraps all the way around the stem. This one's dry, that one's dried up. And then over on the right is, a, is the mulberry again. I seem to use mulberry a lot in these slides, but there it is again, still with this little, this little stipule, leaf-like stipule attached to it. Um, and uh, when they fall off, they actually leave scars. And uh, the ones that have the scars, like over on the left, that wind all the way around the back, um, there's only a few of them. So you'll find those in tree keys uh, come up pretty quick. So it's a pretty important attribute when you have these stipules hanging on a, a twig and it falls off and they've been wrapped all the way around and leave a stipule scar all the way around the twig. Over there on the right, kind of hard to see this one, but the uh, stipule scar, again, of a, of a mulberry, and uh, where it breaks off, it just leaves a little smiley face kind of, kind of pattern and uh, doesn't wrap all the way around the twig. So stipule is a very important uh, attribute. Another attribute you might see in trees is, are these short shoots or spur shoots. This is basically where you have a bud and it breaks open, a couple leaves come out, but it doesn't elongate much. You know, so it just sticks there. And so you develop these little short woody twigs that become very, very apparent when you're looking up into the crown of the tree, uh, especially in the winter. Then you can find trees with wings and ridges, you know, these quirky prominences that, or outgrowths that grow out along the stem. Over on the right, there's a couple of, of our 
Euonema species. One, the top one on the top right is, is the Eastern Wahoo. I love that name, Euonymus atropurpureus. And then the winged burning bush, kind of the, the one that's planted in, in some areas has, has kind of escaped into our woods. And then over on the left is the sweet gum. And these, these sweet gum uh, uh, corky ridges can really be big. I mean, and you, you, might, you might spot one of these things from a long way away and think, what is wrong with that tree? You go over and you see it's a sweet gum with these uh, corky ridges on the bark. Now, finally, uh, on the twig, you know, bud scale scars. And this is, remember, when we have the terminal bud, it's covered with scales. Each one of those scales is connected to the stem. So when the embryonic shoot breaks open the bud and starts to elongate, those bud uh, scales fall off and leave uh, these little bud scale scars shown over on the, on the right-hand side. So all of these little attributes on the twigs, a lot to look for. Finally, sometimes you'll be asked about pith types in these keys. Uh, where there's a number of different types. There are solid pith type, like over on the right. Chambered pith, where you have these little diaphragms or walls with air in between. Then you have diaphragmed pith, where you have the wall. If you look closely, you can see kind of some solid portions in that uh, little yellow poplar there. Diaphragm, but between the diaphragms or the walls is not air, like over on the left, but it's solid. Okay, and then over on the right, you can have a, a hollow pith like on the, in the Paulonia, the princess tree. And uh, actually, the princess tree has kind of a multiple pith. There is a, some chambering around the, the node, and there is hollow uh, in the internodal area. So kind of interesting with pith types. Now, fruit, I, I, don't, I don't talk about this very much, and sometimes it's helpful. You know, some people say, hey, why don't we do a, a, a tree ID workshop with fruit and flowers well they're you know if leaves are ephemeral fruit is a lot more ephemeral <laughs> but some of these things will persist uh, through the winter and stay on for a pretty long time the mountain ash down there on the on the on the left hand side and the american persimmon you know these real fleshy things of course the animals like this so they're not going to last for a long time but you know the, the little dangling balls of the eastern sycamore and and these little flower-like structures actually little samara seeds uh, wrapped around uh, in a coil, coiling fashion around those little cone-shaped uh, uh, structures, you know, those are going to stay on the tree most of the winter. So a good part of the year, you're going to have those to help you out, you know, in tree identification. You know, finally, I just want to talk just a little bit about crown architecture, not too much, but crown architecture is something that, uh, you know, it's the big picture a lot of times. And um, so, uh, so, uh, asking someone else to, to give us their perspective of what they see in crown architecture. I think Blakesley and Jarvis say it very, very well here. A tree in winter is far from being the characterless object many believe. Freed from its covering of leaves, the skeleton of the tree is revealed. And with the method of branching thus clearly discernible, the species may, be generally, may generally be more readily identified at a distance than when in its summer garb. So very important attribute, this, this crown architecture. So one of the main features of crown architecture is the growth habit type. And basically there are two types, the X current habit, and you can say D current habit or deliquescent habit. I use deliquescent because deliquescent means melting away, where you start with a very solid stem and it starts branching and branching and branching until it just melts away into the atmosphere. The X current habit, it's a very, dominant stem. Um, uh, rarely do you get uh, branches going up to compete with the very tippy top part of the tree, the apical meristem, but um, um, you always have the dominant stem there. So we have the white pine on the left there and this uh, honey locust on the right here at our Jackson's Mill State Forestry, uh, State uh, 4-H camp. There's also, a, back in the background, you can see a, a little uh, Norway uh, spruce standing there um, with its dangling little branchlets uh, basically just telling us it's a Norway spruce, one, one of the main attributes of that, that one. So, so a growth habit, very important. Uh, there are different models of crown architecture. You know, this uh, publication by Del Tredici uh, uh, has given us some simple ones. He's composited these from other people. So there's a conifer growth model. We can think of some of the specimens we've seen around. Here's a Don Redwood, very excurrent, very much conifer-like, even though Don Redwood's another one of those things, kind of like the, the larch that drops its leaves in winter. Um, the dogwood model, uh, sassafras fits to that one. And dogwood, the dogwood model is where the lateral branches grow out beyond the last year's terminal 
uh, bud. So the, the lateral buds, the lateral branches are growing faster than that last terminal bud. And they form this kind of pagoda-like structure. In fact, one of the dogwoods is called, you know, the alternate leaf dogwood is called pagoda tree. It forms these little pagodas in its crown. Uh, Norway maple, we talked about the deliquescent habit, this melting away into the atmosphere, and that's kind of what this one uh, is. Uh, the, the, uh, the legumes, right? Here's, here's a honey locust again out in our parking lot with a little snow to help us uh, see the branching structure. You know, this is almost the opposite of the dogwood tree where the, where the branches go up and over the top and kind of arch downward instead of upward. And then finally, the lilac model. And one of the most familiar to maybe to all of us, if you haven't looked at the lilac up close, are, 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 the, are the sumacs, you know, these, these kind of small trees that usually end in a flower structure, a fruiting structure as shown here in this picture. And then, after that, you know, that's at the tip of the twig. So the laterals are, you know, grow out beyond those and form these little Ys as the, as the tree, you know, as the tree grows. Uh, you know, another thing that happens that we, we look at in the woods is this stem form. And for at least a number of species, looking at stem form is very helpful. Uh, some students have a tough time telling between uh, some of the red oaks, we have a, the red oak group, scarlet black and, and northern red oak and pin oak here. And, um, and so scarlet oak on average is much more resistant to dropping their branches than the northern red oak. And, and we call that natural pruning. And it's basically when a, a tree can no longer, um, a, a branch can no longer support itself with you know sugar the sugar solution the the tree will drop those branches off well some trees drop the branches more readily than other trees and you can see here on the right and that scarlet oak does not want to drop those branches you know they'll die and they'll dry up and they might break in a storm or something but they they just don't fall off very easily but the northern red oak over on the right look how smooth that bowl is that's what like the foresters like to see right because it it means that there's not not as many knots and, and defects in in that bowl when you have a clean stem of the tree like that so so northern red oak prunes up very well um this is a picture of a, of a Norway maple. It's my son out there, the sailor, up in uh, New London, Connecticut. Look at the length of that branch reaching out from the base of that tree. That's got to be 30, 35 feet out there. And so that, and that branch isn't going anywhere. So that's not going to drop off. There's enough leaves out there that's supporting that branch growth. And so it's just going to be a, a, a it, you know, it's an open grown tree, basically, at least on that side of the tree. And so uh, that branch is going to hang on for a lot of, a long time time period. You know, but what happens is, you know, sometimes, especially like for pasture trees, you know, a, a farm will say, I've had it with pasturing. I'm not going to do that field anymore. I'm just going to let it go. And so what happens is, you know, natural succession takes place. The forest grows up around it. And those lower branches that had persisted for a long time, they get shaded out by this, the other rapidly growing young, younger trees. And then they, they die off and, and die and get dropped off. And when that happens, when the, when the branch is so big, it's hard to mask that effect. You know, so we can see these bulges and, and old tree scars, on, uh, branch scars on, on this old white oak up, up in Connecticut where you have the, the old stone, stone walls of, of the former pasture. So kind of interesting there. And it helps us interpret the landscape, helps us interpret the past land uses as well. And finally, we have these clonal trees, and um, uh, here's a tree of heaven, and these clonal trees come, arise from adventitious shoots. You know, these are different than the sprouts we see when we do a clear cut and get all these sprouts coming back from the, from the stumps and things. These, these uh, shoots actually arise spontaneously from the, from the roots. The shoot, these, let me say that again, these shoots arise spontaneously from the roots. I hope I said that the first time. And, uh, and they are, are clonal in nature. So here's an example you know, where this knife is uh, by this little shoot coming up. You can follow that root back all the way to the parent tree with a little orange flag on it. We were doing some uh, a chemical control on Tree of Heaven work on interstates and, and a very disturbed site. So, uh, but, uh, but you can see how these shoots just pop up from the roots. And a number of our trees do that. Uh, the sumacs do it, the black locust do Of course, the black locust, the joke is, you know, for farmers, they say, you know, cut a black locust tree, tree down and a thousand come to its funeral, right? Because they pop up from the roots. Uh, but anyway, so clonal roots, they have a, 
their crown architecture can be very obvious sometimes. They look like these little domes of, of, of trees. So in this dome we're looking at, this, this tree of heaven, heaven's up there, most of those could, could be all the, the same genetic individual, just clones of one another. And so um, I always have to, as I'm wrapping up here, I always have to give a shout out to Virginia Tech. Uh, they were one of the first uh, online uh, keys. This is our uh, go-to uh, uh, web page for our national forestry for, uh, forestry invitational, uh, shown there in the, the green, and at the Super Bowl of Forestry, right? Super Bowl of 4-H Forestry. And so... Uh, uh, Great references, you know, there's all sorts of references out there on the web and on smartphones and, and in books, but uh, this is a one, a go-to place for us in our, our 4-H event that we have here in, in uh, West Virginia every year. You know, so, so that's the last slide. And so I'm hoping that, uh, you know, in this process of, of talking about these different features of, of Woody, Woody Trees, that for those new attendees, you may have learned something new, and for those more proficient, uh, maybe got a good rebriefing, uh, uh, but I uh, hope they help you kind of um, uh, think about these trees maybe in a little different way and help you as you, you know, continue, you know, your lifelong um, learning experience or exploration of these, these really, really amazing organisms. You know, so, so that's it, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or just chat a while, you know, if, uh, if Pete's there. I'm here, Dave. That okay, was great. That was fabulous. I'm just, uh, I was mesmerized. Huh. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was really great. I mean, it's just, well, you. you know, I've, I've, the terminology, you know, I'd heard all of that before, but you packaged it together in a way that just, it really made it fun oh, nice. to, to think about and, and to explain the details about why things hmm. happen the way they oh, do. Great. You know, it's one thing to memorize a bunch of stuff, but then to understand what's happening. So that oh, was wonderful. a great, great, great job. Okay. And there's already a lot of questions that have come in. And this is the chance if uh, people have questions about the presentation that uh, you can type them in. For those of you who are curious, this is being recorded and I will post this, uh, the archive of this uh, noon hour presentation to the Forest Connect channel um, on YouTube. So let me, um, let me scroll back to the beginning. Someone was asking the Virginia Tech website, I see. Yes. And I probably should have put that there. Maybe I will for seven o'clock. <laughs> so I will. So while you're answering, I'll see if I can find. The, I mean, if if you do a Google search for yeah. Virginia Tech Dendrology, I'm sure that that will. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty right there. Up, yeah. Right. Yeah. So let me. Uh, lots of back and forth. So. So I posted, there's a lot of New York people, and uh, early on I posted a link for a dichotomous key and in, in tree identification guide in New York. It's called the, if you just do a search for know your trees, New yeah. York, you'll, that'll come up. Um, and I mentioned, I meant to mention that in the talk, but I, I failed to. And I, and I think every state, I mean, actually I have a publication, I believe from, well, I have one from Maine and one from West Virginia, really good um, tree identification guides. Every state has them usually put out through the extension, the cooperative extension system of that state. So that's always a, a good place to go. So here's the first question you were talking about. Um, I'm guessing this was at 1220. So I'm not sure what exactly you were showing at that time. Maybe the, the profile of the tree, uh, inner bark, outer bark. And the question is, okay. is there a sharp edge between inner and outer bark or does it gradually go from inner or outer <laughs> reducing? Sugar? That's great. That is, gr that is a really neat question. And it's something that I... You know that book on bark will will approach answering that I think, but I think it's it's variable because bark actually, and I didn't talk about this in the in the talk, but bark actually has its own meristem. You know, it's called the cork cambium, and it's the cork cambium kind of is as far as I understand is produced within the phloem at some point, 
and it, 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 in, some, in some cases it can be these little lenses of tissue that on the outside of the meristem produces cork and on the inside this another type of tissue and there's names for all these things and I haven't come prepared to really to answer those things but there's it's kind of like the, the vascular cambium in terms of it's a meristematic tissue it produces tissue on the outside of it and on the inside of it. so so it's a, it's actually a very complex tissue and it um, and so the distinction between the inner and outer bark um, is usually pretty distinct though. I mean, when you're looking at it, actually what we're seeing when we look at the inner bark, we're looking at, on a, on a larger tree, we're looking at years of compressed cells because the phloem actually only a few cells thick um, or a year's worth of phloem tissue that's been produced is functional. And after that, it's very sensitive tissue and it kind of breaks down and compresses. And so you kind of get this, matty looking and what is it called bast i think you know where you strip the bark off the tree and you get to the inner bark and you can weave stuff out of it right um that's all inner bark tissue so at, at some point in time it was functional and uh, but a uh, very sensitive tissue uh, for as a vascular tissue but once it's kind of dead and crushed and 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 it and there's all sorts I could go on and watch out. I might go on a tangent, but it's really tough to study phloem tissues because when you puncture it, if you want to get inside, it actually damages the cell to some extent that you can't collect measurements of the fluid inside. That's my. That's just a kind of some readings I've done. I'm not an expert on it, uh, but uh, they've been exploring like these these insects that put stylets into the into the bark, like the like the uh, beach. Uh, the beach uh, scale, things like that, uh, because they, they can put um, their stylet in and it really doesn't damage it. So they're looking into all this kind of things. How can they explore phloem tissue in a way that doesn't really destroy the tissue itself? So I don't know if I answer that question, but sometimes it's a very distinctive and sometimes I think it's less distinctive. That's not a very good answer, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay, Eric wants to know, uh, he says, what is a lateral wart-like branch? A lateral wart-like branch. Did I, uh, so did I say lateral wart-like branch? I, I often talk in, in these seminars and, and uh, wonder if my tongue gets tied and I say something <laughs> funny. But a lateral, if, when I think of a lateral wart-like branch, um, I might be thinking of a small little like, what we called, you know, talked about the clustered leaf arrangement where uh, things like the larch that I showed in the picture and then the ginkgos. Sh the short shoots and ginkgo, yeah, yeah. sure. And ginkgos birches. have them, yeah, birches. And, and so um, I'm not quite sure. There. So there's is. another question I think about the, sh the short shoots. So we'll, oh. maybe we'll come back to that. And if okay. Eric's still on, maybe he can clarify that question. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so Jeremy wants to know, are there any trees that are more prone to buttress roots or is that only a factor of growing condition? Wow. Um, well, I think, I, I don't know the, the kind of the genetics behind it, you know, what, what's going to develop, but we, you know, we see buttressing, of course, in, in uh, some of the bald cypress that we have around here just but it's not nothing like you see down in the tropics where you see some of these giant buttresses coming off these trees and they're actually almost like form walls as they go down into the roots you know those are the buttresses but uh, uh we have we have a champion uh bald cypress tree down in Weston I'd like to bring people to. It's, it's about 200 years old. And of course, I brought people from Louisiana. You said someone from Louisiana was on. And I said, because uh, there's a little bronze plaque, you know, it says this may be one of the largest in the United States. And they're going, no, no, but it's a big tree. It's a big tree. It's even putting the knees, you know, the woody knees that come up out of the water. It's putting some of those up through the asphalt of the road. And, wow. um, but and it has these big, long, almost buttresses actually coming down from the from the uh, from the branches and so it gives it a, a bust buttressed appearance although the buttresses technically go from the stem down into the root 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 uh, system okay uh, Tom wants to know and this is I this is I would ask the same question why don't twigs elongate and thus form uh, short shoots or spur shoots what what triggers that 
or doesn't agree with that. <laughs> yeah, this this was a tree ID, not a tree uh, <laughs> physiology. Not physiology, right? But um, and, and so I don't know what that is, and that's a great question. And you know, if you live next to one of these trees, you might snip off the tip of the branch and uh, allow it to grow. And and my guess, if I had to guess, it would be it's hormonal control. Uh, because when we think about, and I didn't talk about dormant buds and things like that. I've take, took some of that stuff out, but, but, you know, when you have a lateral bud at the, you know, so th imagine a shoot growing, you got the lateral buds there, the leaves fall off, they're still there. Most of those do not elongate. Most of those embryonic shoots do not elongate. They become dormant and they actually kind of sink down inside the bark and grow with the bark every year. And they're either just at the surface or just below that bark. And, and they are kept dormant by a flow of hormones that come out of that very terminal or apical growing tip, right? So there's this constant flow of hormones coming down through the stem and it keeps those lateral buds dormant right beneath the bark. Sometimes they split up, sometimes they divide. And when there's a disturbance on the tree when if something bites it off or if the crown breaks off or is snapped off a tornado comes it's it's snapped off or defoliated the hormonal flow is disrupted and then those buds break dormancy and pop out of the stem we call those epicormic sprouts and um and so i'm guessing that those those short shoots may behave similarly if you if you lop off the tip of that branch but that's just a guess <laughs> so okay um, there's uh, Eric, all same Eric wants to know about the uh, Forestry Invitational website, and I'll just if you do oh. a, search, a Google search for 4-H Forestry Invitational, yeah, that Jackson that is there. Mill. That should be on that slide uh, at the top of the green box. Is it not there? No. Uh oh. But I, I mean, it's okay. so I was trying to do a quick search for that, and, and I oh, think yeah. I got a hit. So oh, good, yeah, great. Okay. There's a lot of good information on that. You know, these students that come, you know, we usually get, you know, 15 to 17 teams come and it's a collection of extension. Gary Goff used to be on the committee, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we've gotten some really good teams from New York uh, uh, come down and compete and uh, from Pennsylvania, all the, New, the New England states. It's a great opportunity for young kids because, or young people, because they come and they meet people from Texas and Alabama, and, and uh, it's just a great time, uh, you know, because it's 4-H, so it's not all just about the competition, it's about education too. And so we have fun and we also compete. But there's a lot of good information that they have to, they have to learn a lot, and there's some really sharp, sharp students that come in that could probably compete with, uh, you know, some other, <laughs> forestry students that we know so mm -hmm. so there are lots of um accolades to the presentation here dave and it was just you know you know from several several these are foresters and they appreciate it in the context of oh, even having had a dendrology course so oh great scrolling through i think uh everybody loved it I'm just okay. Here we are. Oh, I, I, I I'm now scrolling through. I can see those too. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I didn't pay uh, attention to those too. Uh, so Sean says regarding the ability of a tree to shed branches, hmm. you mentioned that it is good for the use of wood if the tree loses the branch because hmm. then there are no knots. But do the knots really disappear from where the branch was? The uh, only after the tree compartmentalizes that wound, right? Because if you imagine, a, a, a let's say the tree branch cracks right off at the surface of the bark, you know, the next five years that bark is probably getting, well, depending on the size of the branch, is going to grow over that uh, branch wound. And all the wood that's produced, all the xylem tissue that's produced after that, it's going to be clear. But but there's no, you know, th those the the inside of the tree is uh, is going to stay the way it is. So if, the, if you cut deep enough into the tree, you'll find those. Especially if you've probably seen this in in pine trees that have been pruned, you know, and well, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. <laughs> that uh, you prune them, and then 15 years later, you cut them down. You can kind of go back, and you can see that the point. Uh, at those branch whorls, if they're if they're you know pine trees, uh, at the branch whorls, uh, you can see you know where you can see the pruning wounds really. 
So you'll never get rid of them completely, but the new wood that's produced after that, they'll, that they, they, it will no longer have, uh, it'll, it'll be clear wood, we say. All right, Michael wants to know if the bark pattern of ash is ever referred to as reticulate, which Ooh, means resembles ouch. a net. Geez, I bet it is. It's just not one I use. Yeah, yeah that's a great. That's one. great. That's I great. like that. Yeah, I like learning new terms. You know, yeah. so you, yeah, reticulate. Is, so I, I mean, I'm a casual student of Latin, um, and so uh -huh. and dendrology is a great way to to play that out because <laughs> it's just it's so uh, thick with Latin. Mm -hmm. um, reticulate. So Marjorie says, I guess we can use this YouTube video available for classes and or master gardener meeting presentation. Yes, of course, there are no copyright issues. Um, and I know Mar I know Marjorie. Um, and on okay. the, uh, so obviously you can use this. You could not um, download it and reproduce it and sell it, but you could download it and reproduce it and give it away. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Kit wants to know if there's anything that we can do to reduce plant blindness. Um, it's a problem, <laughs> not least in urban areas where policymakers appear unconcerned by habitat and tree loss right. at alarming rates. So I think one thing that, I mean, the and this is kind of a tangent maybe to this question, but what struck me is I was looking, you had really good pictures and to show a tiny little aspect of a plant like a bud or a leaf scar and to show examples even from just three or four different plants highlights the differences that exist between plants and mm -hmm. it's just it, it uh for me it was a very powerful message about how different plants are and how um, valuable it is for people that are interested in plants and the mm -hmm. benefit the plants provide to society um, the benefit of knowing how to identify those. So that's, I mean, I guess that's my kind of roundabout way to talk about plant blindness is to be able to highlight these, you know, even on a single attribute. I mean, the other, another great attribute is, you know, the caps of acorns. You know, mm -hmm. you can, you can, as Dave knows, and many of you know, you can differentiate uh, many of the acorns just on the cap of many of the oak trees. You can differentiate them just based on the cap of the acorn. So those are, I don't know, Dave, do you want to yeah. talk any more about plant blindness? Well, it's, um, you know, you, the, uh, what, one of the, one of the things in our society that really comes out and, and, and we are pro conservation, you know, uh, but, but there, you can, you can almost see plant blindness in our conservation efforts. You know, here in our state, we have these wonderful programs for warblers. We have a cerulean warbler, golden wing warbler, and, um, and, you know, they're, are not really many plant-based issues. You know, we we see declining populations of an animal, and we'll we try and resolve it. Um, and a lot of times that has to do with habit, the habitat itself. Um, and um, and at the same time, some wildlife biologists see this, and they and they bring up the question: um, Why are we not managing on a landscape? you know we're 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 focusing on these single species problems and uh, instead of looking at this landscape effort so um you know I, I joke with people i say you know if if you go out there and 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 wave this flag and say you know i'm speaking for biodiversity you know <laughs> or i'm speaking for the the indian cucumber root you know people are going to kind of look at you funny you know but if you go out there and say well the golden wing warblers you know we're or uh, you know some of these other you know cheap mountain salamander we have some things like that. Um, it's just different, you know. And so I think you're right. I think showing these different perspectives of what these plants really are and how really cool they are, it, it would is helpful. Like like I said, we we do kind of um, love our trees. We love our trees, no question about that. Um, and we we um we glorify them some of them like the champion trees um and so and maybe it is just taking these examples of, of of looking at trees in ways that you may not have looked at them or people generally don't look at them uh and and bring them out bring that out to people but that's a that's a that's a process i mean you know it took you know 
it takes a while to, you know, show some slides or, you know, say, hey, look at this in a way that people are going to, you know, that's one thing I like, why, why I like this, t you know, doing these kind of workshops. When we go out in the state, we, we, I do a little PowerPoint like this, and then we take a break and we hand out little 10 power magnifying hand lenses to everyone, and we walk them through these old keys. And the first time you just teach someone to learn, learn how to use a loop, uh, one of these little hand lenses, and they bring that specimen into focus, you can hear them say, oh my goodness, you know, because they've never really looked up close at these plants before. So I remember, I remember it happened to me too. I'd been plant taxonomy. We had these dissecting scopes and we had to like dissect the ovaries of flowers and look at the, the placentation, you know, the, the positioning of these little ovules inside the, the, uh, the ovaries and things. It's like, oh my gosh, I, you know, who even, who's, whoever even looks at this stuff? <laughs> you know, so, so it's botany uh, students. Right. Botany <laughs> students. Right. So. Uh, Rosemary wants to know the reason there are burls on campus. Oh, man, that's great. Well, I think some of that's still kind of unknown. You know, there are some speculations about viruses and bacteria and fungi that, that may cause this an irritation. Pete, do you have a good, have you looked into that a little bit? No, I, no. I know that yeah. there are some um, pathogens or pathogenic organisms like mycoplasmas and bacteria that uh -huh. trigger burls, but I don't, I don't know uh, a definitive answer. Yeah, that's a, that's a toughie. So, um, Marjorie and maybe others want to know about the uh, dichotomous key, uh, which is a great tool for people who've never used a dichotomous key. Those are, are great. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether those can be printed. So, if you um, use any of the links to an online tree identification, you can probably print those or go to your cooperative extension office and ask for a copy of the state tree identification guide. And I think all of the states have a printed or would have an old version at least and they could photocopy those dichotomous keys. All right, Irene wants to know if there's a good way to root a twig so take a twig and a cutting and get it to form roots well it depends on the species right i mean some species are are, are used in production for biomass energy or other you know pulp wood because you can root them easily when i i worked at west vaco for a while as a research scientist down in the southern part of the state and um, we were working with some scientists uh, both in south carolina and kentucky uh, looking to see how we can make uh, some of the some of the poplar species, the um, the populous species, the aspens and the and the and the hybrid poplars, uh, produce for us in different in different kind of areas, even on cutover sites. And so they're you know within the populous genus, the aspens and the poplars, um, there the the aspens tend to let's get this right, not be able to root so well, but the populous like the cottonwoods tend to root better. So um, there was uh, so you, so um, so for example, we could stick some stems, t just the the branches into the ground and have them grow, and uh, others we would have to try to you know, apply some um, some horm root ho root hormone like usually I think IBA and uh, to it to see if we can stimulate the root growth of that. But but for for the most part. Um, uh, it really is species specific. And so, and I think, I think it, at Penn State, they were doing some work and, and it took them a while, but, um, and of course it's been a couple, <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, that they finally were able to root an oak uh, uh, stem. So, uh, but, I, but I don't work in that kind of horticultural aspect of woody plants very much. And even the kind of the reproductive side of things where, you know, a tree nursery will try and uh, root cuttings, or they will uh, try to propagate a whole bunch of of uh, of of, of, uh, of of clones of the same you know same species, same individual. We have had an interest in New York. We have uh, plantations of uh, maple trees that have very high sugar concentrations, and we've mm. and I've never been directly involved, in even not indirectly involved, but had um, Lou Stats, who was the maple specialist for decades, uh, spent a lot of time trying to 
trying to develop a process to make rooted cuttings of these sugar maple trees. And I don't think he ever succeeded. So uh -huh, wow. Uh, some of the current work is using wow. tissue culturing to uh -huh. uh, vegetatively propagate. But yeah, there are some, some trees that, you know, they'll root when the branch hits the ground and, and others uh -huh. uh, you, you can't for, for love nor money get them to root. <laughs> um, so Steve says, he notes that there are phone apps that you can get where you can uh, have an identification of a photograph of the leaf and he wants to know if there are any apps for identifying uh, plants and trees from a photo of the twig or the bark. Wow, not that I know of. I'm familiar with some of the ones that, at least one of them that I, uh, that you can kind of like take the leaf, make sure it's like on a good background and take a picture and it comes up with something. Um, I, I usually don't use those because, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but the, the online keys, I think I may have mentioned it, you know, it really, they, they aren't necessarily, they won't necessarily come to a single species sometimes. And that's the same with some of the phone, phone apps, depending on where you are and how good a quality of the leaf you have and how distinctive the leaf is that you have is, um, sometimes it'll kind of give you a list of potentials. You know, well, it could be one of these six or one of these 12. And, um, but I'm not familiar with any that do bark or, 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 uh, or buds. Or right. I, have, I have not seen any. The one that, as you were talking though, Dave, one that something, that, two things that came to mind is one, you can always send a picture to your, you know, your state extension forester to, you know, to Dave or to I or to whatever state, wow. you're in because, you know, a lot of times we just, I mean, I just enjoy that. That's a, yeah. those are fun emails to get. <laughs> um, the other option is there's a f online forum called Forestry Forum. So the word forestry, then F-O-R-U-M dot com. And it, and there are, within this forum, there are sections that deal with, you know, wood miser sawmills and, um, uh, you know, small scale logging. And then there's one on tree identification or dendrology and people will post pictures of trees. There are thousands of members and then people will go in and, and give their best guess about what they think that tree is. So that's, that's probably as close to a phone app, but it's more like an expert panel than it is a, a phone app. All right. And then the last question that I see is from Eli wants to know if um, beech and or birch would f would root well, and I would guess that neither one of them would root particularly well. But Dave, do you know differently? A tough call, you know. My if 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 the question were were from a professor and and said which of these two would root better, yeah, I'd right. probably select beech because it's one of those that can can generate these adventitious. Uh, shoots coming from the roots it suckers from the roots and uh, so I guess that would be the one but I, I don't have any experience with that I've never taken a beech you know twig and tried to, to root that or a birch or, uh, either hmm. nor I yeah. Yeah. well Dave um, thank you very much this was an oh, absolutely pleasure. fabulous presentation I just I really I mean I enjoy all the guest speakers and this was yeah. just really okay. um, great uh, gripping and riveting and uh, <laughs> a lot oh, of fun you. and, and the, all of the comments uh, shared the same sentiment. So great. Uh, and I'm sure you can hear the applause from the audience <laughs> yeah. and yeah. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll welcome Dave back again with the same presentation this evening at seven o'clock. So if you want to see it again, then join us again. Okay, and, great. Uh, yeah. You all have a, so Dave, if you want to log out, you can, and then okay. just join back in about, quarter till or 10 till this evening. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Thank, thank you, you and all. thanks everyone. Okay. Yes, thank you all. Bye-bye.